So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our climate change in the classroom uh, event. This is our last open lecture of this webinar series on climate change and related topics. And we have the pleasure of welcoming Dan Wood with us today. Um, so I'll do a bit of an introduction and then Dan will be presenting her work. Uh, Dan is a PhD student at the Institute of Marine and Atmospheric Research, uh, Utrecht, affiliated to the Utrecht University. She does research in the marine carbon cycle and the Earth's climate and feedbacks between the two. She has a degree in hydraulic engineering and in climate physics. Um, so Dan, it's a pleasure to have you with us today and we are really excited to hear more about what you are doing. So the floor is yours, you can start whenever you're ready. Yes, thank you. And I will just share my screen and uh, I will be able to start. So uh, thank you all for joining and uh, thank you for having me. Um, today I will give a talk about the ocean and more specifically uh, the role of the ocean in the, in the Earth's climate. Um, and I want to start with giving a, a, a short introduction to, to the ocean. Um, because the ocean is actually very important for our Earth. Uh, and we know that 71% uh, of our Earth's surface is covered by oceans, actually. But um, actually, only 5% uh, of our oceans have been explored. So it's really, really difficult to, to observe the ocean. It is mostly because the ocean is also very deep. It's on average 4 kilometers deep. Uh, and the deepest point is actually uh, 11 kilometers deep, and it's the Mariana Trench uh, near the Philippines. And uh, it's actually the case, and that's, uh, I was quite surprised to hear that, is that we have more accurate maps of the surface of Mars than we have of the, the bottom of the ocean. So I, I, I also think that says something about how much we still do not know about, about the ocean, even though it, it, it's, it's, it's so uh, important for us. Um, we also know that in the ocean, the, the most wildlife on Earth resides in the ocean. I mean, we have like different mammals such as whales and seals, but we also have large fish like sharks, uh, all the way to all the, the tiniest plankton species um, that are uh, a complete ecosystem in, uh, in, uh, in the ocean. And also this ecosystem is a large source of oxygen actually for, the, uh, for our atmosphere. And this is also very important for us to, to be able to breathe. Um, so the oceans basically uh, enable us to live on this planet, which is pretty awesome, I think. Um, what I'm about to show you now, and I hope uh, this will work, uh, is an animation of what I would like to call a very simplified version of uh, the ocean, um, which is based on model simulations. And when I say simplified, this might not, make, it might not look very simple to you. But this is in actually a very simplified uh, way of our ocean circulation. Um, and what you see here is, uh, is the Gulf Stream near North America. And you see a strong current uh, next to the coast of the, of the US. And you see all this meandering and you see all these, these rings and these eddies, these whirls. Um, and even though this is very, a very simplified view, this is actually already quite complicated and quite complex. Uh, and now we go to another interesting region of our ocean that is um, around South Africa, where we all see these rings shedding and move around the Cape of, of Africa. And also just generally we see in, in the Indian Ocean, but in every ocean basin, we see these meandering flows, uh, these eddies. And um, I mean, these kind of simulations, these kind of flows is why I like to, to work with the ocean so much because it's so complicated. It's and we still know so little about it, but it's also, at least to me, it's, 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 it's also kind of beautiful, I think, these simulations. Um, and yeah, so this is also what I'm working with uh, on, a, on, a, on a daily basis, actually. Um, but yeah, today, uh, this is as complicated as the ocean circulation is going to get. Uh, we're going to look at it from a more simplified point of view. But before we go to, uh, to the actual ocean circulation, uh, I want to take a step back to, to, to the bigger view. Uh, and that is what we like to call in, uh, in our uh, community, the Earth system, because 
what I show here is a figure of the Earth system. And today we will mostly look at the ocean. But if we live on the Earth, we live, we, we don't only have an ocean, we also have sea ice on the ocean. We have uh, evaporation from the ocean to the atmosphere. We have the solar radiation. There are so many complex processes on Earth and they all interact with each other. Uh, as we will see later today, we are also very dependent, the cities we live in, uh, on the ocean. We are influenced by the ocean. Um, and so actually is our, our the, the, the vegetation, the ice sheets. Um, so the point I'm trying to make here is, is today we will focus on, on the ocean, but the ocean is, is part of a very large system we call Earth. Um, so it's often not sufficient to only look to the ocean. Um, and today we will just mostly look to the ocean because that's already complicated enough. But I want you also to know uh, the bigger picture. Um, and then we can go more to the, to the climate side. Uh, and just to give a ballpark definition of climate, it's often used as the average weather of 30 years. It's not completely accurate, but it is what we'll work with. I mean, it's, it's quite simple uh, to, uh, it's, it's more easy to, uh, to understand this. Um, so how does this, this climate system work? Well, it's mostly driven by solar radiation. So we get warmth for the sun um, and this enters uh, the atmosphere. And when this enters the, the atmosphere, part of it is actually reflected by, um, by the clouds and by particles we have in our, in our atmosphere. Uh, but some reach the Earth's surface and Part of that what reaches the surface is also reflected back into space. Uh, and this is mostly done by very light uh, surfaces such as ice and snow. Uh, but others actually get absorbed by the Earth's surface and then we get warming of the surface. Um, now, is generally space is a lot colder than our Earth is. So you can maybe imagine that our Earth sort of works as a heater for space as well. So we have also radiation leaving our earth and this is the, these red arrows over here um, but not all of the radiation that that makes it to space some of it is captured by what we call greenhouse gases and they reflect it back to our surface to the earth's surface and this actually causes warming and it's actually important to note here that without these greenhouse gases uh, we would not be able to live on earth because it would be way too cold um, but you can maybe also expect that the more greenhouse gases we have, the more warming we will have. But that we will look at, at later. Um, and then I have here two uh, animations of temperature over here and precipitation over here. And precipitation is basically rainfall. But first, let's focus on temperature. What we are seeing here is, a, uh, is the climate for basically every week of, of the year. That's what you see moving. So now we're here in December and January at this point. Uh, and you see how uh, our climate temperature, our average temperature is expected to be. And you can clearly see the, the seasons change that it gets colder in the Northern hemisphere here in winter and warmer in summer. Um, and also for the precipitation, you see, uh, interesting things happening like in the Sahara it's it's completely dry but in the tropics there's a lot of rainfall um, and we will take a look, closer look uh, at that later um, it's not completely the topic of my of my uh, talk today but I want to uh, touch upon it uh, I deliberately chose not to go too much into the climate change uh, storyline because I think uh, before we can understand climate change, we first need to understand the climate itself. Um, so I will be mostly just talking about the ocean, but in these times it's, it's hard to, to ignore the climate change storyline. So I will touch upon it shortly. So effects of climate change can of course be uh, global warming, uh, for which I show an image here where you see in these colors, um, how much the, uh, the temperature has changed in the last 50 years. And you see that in almost all regions we have, we have warming. And if we take here, if we uh, sum it up over the entire earth and take the average, we get a warming of more than one degrees already. And that's actually quite a lot. 
But besides this global warming, we also get, of course, sea level rise, uh, which is over the last 115 years already approximately 25 centimeters. And though that might not sound as much, uh, the country where I'm from, the Netherlands, it's, it's uh, half of the country is almost below sea level. Uh, so actually 25 centimeters is already quite a lot for us here. And it's only expected to, uh, to increase more. Uh, we have loss of sea ice, and we also have changing weather patterns, such as more heat waves and maybe even more storms or more intense rainfall uh, events. So what is the cause of this climate change? I think most people already know that it's because of the greenhouse gas emissions, such as carbon dioxide and methane. And what I show here in blue is the atmospheric CO2 concentration. And in black, we see the, the, the carbon dioxide emissions. And we can clearly see a relation between the, these emissions and, and the concentration. And the same applies to, to methane here, where we see more than a doubling of the last 250 years. And this causes uh, the climate to change. Um, but that is what I want to tell about uh, climate change. Uh, now I want to go to the, the ocean's role in, in, in the climate. So now we're going to step back to the ocean. Um, and for the what I call short-term climate, so this is more on the on you know the, the time scale of one one to, to 30 years. Our ocean is very important to, to, to store heat, but it can also provide heat to the atmosphere and it can provide moisture or water for, for precipitation. Um, and on longer term, it is also very good to store carbon dioxide. Um, so this is more the, the hundreds to thousands of years time scale where uh, the ocean can store a lot of uh, carbon dioxide. Um, yeah, and in climate change, the ocean's role is mostly to store heat, uh, thereby reducing um, reducing the warming of the earth and also storing a lot of carbon around 25% of what we've admitted as humans is uh, currently in the ocean. So without, um, without the oceans, we would have a way higher carbon dioxide concentrations in our atmosphere. Um, so now um, we're going to separate a little bit to look at the, the temperature. And what I show here is uh, the temperature in winter and the temperature in summer at the surface. Uh, and now I'd like to give you a few seconds to, to look at these maps and maybe see for yourself if you can find some interesting patterns which might be related to the, to the ocean. So I hope you had some uh, uh, had a look at it. Um, so the first thing I'd like to point out is I draw this line now, and uh, the idea of this line is that it's on the same latitudes all, uh, at all places, uh, and that basically means it gets the same amount. All places along this line get the same amount of radiation of the sun. So based on that, you would maybe expect them to have the same temperature. But if we follow uh, this line, starting uh, here I'm, in Canada. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, we have Luisa in the chat who's just asking if it was summer in the northern hemisphere that you were talking ah. about. Yeah, this is uh, based on the northern hemisphere, true. OK, thank you. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I should have mentioned it indeed. Um, so we're here in northern hemisphere winter, uh, and we see that in Canada, we see these, these, these sub zero uh, temperatures. But if we move over to over the Atlantic Ocean to Western Europe, which get the same amount of solar radiation, but you see here the average temperature is around 10 degrees. So that's, it's, that's almost a 20 degrees difference for the same amount of solar radiation. And then if we move further to you know, Siberia, Mongolia, we again see these sub zero temperatures. Uh, and this is actually the influence of, of, of the ocean here, the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and another aspect I wanted to show was um, if you compare the two boxes between winter and summer, 
then you see that in Western Europe, maybe the average temperature in this box is 10 degrees in winter and 20 degrees in summer. And if you look at uh, Siberia, you see the average temperature is my, maybe minus 30 and also around 20. So you see there's this way bigger difference between winter and summer. And this is actually also the influence of, of, of our ocean. Um, and then we can do the same for, for precipitation. So the rainfall, and here we see that the regions closer to the sea are uh, experiencing way more rainfall than, for example, Siberia. We have around the equator, we have this line of very much pre precipitation. And we have also like this region here, also where we have quite a lot of precipitation. And this is all due to, to ocean, oceanic effects, actually. Um, so we will look into that more later, the, the exact reasons behind that. Uh, and we also look at carbon uptake, so the, the uptake of carbon dioxide uh, out of the atmosphere. And here we see two interesting regions, uh, again, the equator, where here in red represents uh, that carbon goes from the ocean back into the atmosphere. And we see especially this region in front of the South American coast that puts a lot of carbon dioxide back into our atmosphere. And also the same applies to, to the Southern Ocean, the seas around uh, Antarctica. And these are all actually the, the things that now I pointed out are mostly related to the oceanic circulation. Um, but to sum up for now, the ocean's role is that we see it influences temperature and precipitation and, the take, uh, and the, uh, how much carbon it takes up out of the atmosphere. But the main point here is that we see the, these large differences. We see, for example, this region around the Gulf Stream. We see uh, some differences locally and the equator and the Southern Ocean. And these are all related to, um, to the ocean circulation. So uh, that's the next step we are actually going to do. We're going to look at uh, the ocean circulation um, and how that actually physically works. So we can roughly divide the ocean circulation into two components, uh, which add to each other. So we first have the wind-driven circulation. And uh, you can already see this is a uh, way more simplified than we saw before in the animation. Uh, and here, the main idea is that we have like these gyre structures in our ocean basins, which are in, in the North Atlantic and the South Atlantic. You see, also see it in the Pacific, um, where we have forward currents on the western side of the basin here. And, these, and then uh, at this point, equator ward on the eastern side of the basin. Uh, and you see the same here in the South Atlantic. Uh, and this is the wind driven circulation. And then we have also what we call the thermal haline circulation, where thermal represents effects of temperatures and haline represents uh, effects of salt, because you probably all know if you've ever been to the to the beach, uh, there is salt in the in the in the sea, um, and this is definitely this is uh, also causes uh, uh, effects on the circulation because the main idea behind this thermal haline driven circulation is that there are what we call density differences in the ocean, and these uh, these cause uh, a circulation in our ocean. Um, and we will first look at that. Um, but first, this wind driven circulation is more on the shorter terms. So that's again, we're again that year to, to, to 30 year time scale, and this is more on the thousand year time scale, the circulation. But to start with the thermal hurland circulation, um, I mentioned it already density. Uh, density can be seen as the uh, a mass per volume. It's basically the scientific definition. But for now, if you can also understand it, the weight of, for example, one liter of water, and that is not constant in the ocean. If you take uh, one liter of water out of the uh, North Atlantic Ocean, it weighs differently than if you get one liter of water out of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and this is because there are temperature and salt differences in our ocean. Uh, and the flow likes to go from high density waters to low density waters. So to illustrate that, uh, we have here 
temperature and salt, uh, and we have four different uh, water boxes. So they, these are all the same volume, but box one is a very warm, uh, warm water with almost no salt. Uh, box two is warm and salty. Uh, box three is cold and fresh. And box four is um, cold and salty. So to illustrate where these boxes may come from, box one could, for example, be uh, water from the Amazon River. Box two could be from the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, box three could be from the Baltic Sea, the sea between uh, Finland and Sweden. And four could be from the Antarctic Seas and the deep ocean. So now our main question is if, if, dense, if the water likes to flow from uh, high density or heavy water to low density and light water, which one is actually heaviest of these parcels? Um, and what it turns out is that uh, from heaviest to lightest is that box four is the densest, is the heaviest, then the Mediterranean sea water, then the Baltic sea water, and then the Amazon river water. So what you can take home from this is that the, the density of the water uh, is that if there's more salt, the water is denser. And if the temperature of the, the water is lower, it's also heavier. Uh, and salt is here more important than the, than the temperature. Um, so most of our ocean, we have this situation. We have light water on top of heavy water, and that's nice, that's stable, uh, not a lot happens there. But there are certain reaches in the ocean where at some point we get heavy water above light water, and that's actually not, not stable. Um, so in the next slide, I'm going to show an uh, animation where we have in the beginning uh, a heavy fluid uh, in the top layer, which is green, and a light uh, fluid on the bottom, which is yellow. And then we're going to see what actually happens when this occurs in, uh, in, in nature. Uh, and basically what you see is that the green fluid wants to go down uh, and you get complete mixing. You get all these eddies, you get these whirls. Uh, and now you can basically, there is no green fluid anymore. There is no yellow fluid anymore. It's now all purplish, bluish, um, and it's mixed. So this is also sort of what happens in our ocean uh, and mostly at two different locations uh, here in the seas around Greenland and here in the seas around Antarctica. And the process we call this is, this is deep water formation. And this is basically the process where waters from the surface mix uh, up to the deep ocean. Um, yeah, that, that, that is what happens there. And this is uh, very important for driving this, this circulation that you see here. Um, so let's have a closer look at that. And we will only look at the Atlantic Ocean because there we have this deep water formation here. So this is our Atlantic Ocean. This is our surface. And this is our bottom. Um, so on the right hand side here, we have the North Pole with ice bear, with polar bears. And here we have the South Pole with penguins. And uh, I'm around here with my dog. Uh, this is just a good excuse to show a picture of my dog. It's not relevant, but I just want to show a picture of my dog. Um, and what we just see, saw is that we have these mixing here in the North, near the, near the North Pole. And we have this mixing near the South Pole. Um, and now we have this, this, this downward transport of, of mass, basically, of water. Uh, but this water has to come from somewhere. Um, and the only option that for this, this northern water is, is to come via the surface. And, and measurements and physics show that we have here at the surface uh, a warm current going northward. Uh, and this is partly also, the Gulf Stream is also part of this, this current. And then our observations show that in the deep waters, we have a return current, which is called going back towards the South Pole, where we can form the, the other cell. And you can already see like that this is a very cold, dense cell. And this is, this is somewhat warmer. Uh, and this is also part of the, of the Gulf Stream. 
Um, so, and the reason why we have like this water comes back to the surface at this point is actually because of the wind drift circulation, uh, which we will look at next. Um, so I will get th this image back. So here we have the gyro circulations again. And what I show here is the wind field actually above the ocean. And here you can actually already see that it's quite natural. Uh, then we get these gyro circulations in the ocean. For example, if you look at the, at the North Atlantic, we can already see that the wind sort of forces the ocean to move like this, in this direction. And we see that in, also in the, in the Pacific, we already automatically get these, these, these gyro structures just because of how the wind, uh, the direction of the wind in our atmosphere. Uh, and these, this wind driven circulation has some important features that are important for our climate. Uh, the first one is what we call Western boundary currents, such as the Gulf Stream. Um, and what we know is that on the Western side of the, the basin, so in this case, it's um, the coast of the, the US, we have this very strong currents. Well, at the Eastern side, there are hardly any, any large currents. Um, and what this Gulf Stream does, it takes the warm waters from the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico, and it transports it all the way over the Atlantic Ocean to Western Europe. So this is one important part of the wind-driven circulation. Uh, the other part is what we call equatorial upwelling. And I'm gonna explain that now. Here we have part of the sea around the equator um, and there are winds blowing these are these green arrows and the on either side of the equator we have uh, like winds blowing into the western direction now as a response the ocean currents uh, flow like this they uh, do not completely follow um, the winds and this is because of uh, the turning of our that the, that the earth spins around its axis but that's uh, a discussion for another time. So now you maybe just have to believe that our ocean currents do this. Um, and what happens? So now we look at it from the side, and then this is again the equator, and this is depth. And then we see at the surface that our warm currents go outward. And this means that here we need to get some, uh, some water. And that actually comes from the deep ocean, that water flows here. Uh, to the surface, and this is actually cold water coming to the surface. Uh, and similar processes are also occurring in the Southern Ocean. Um, so now we've learned a little bit about the, the circulation. So now let's try to see what we learned in the beginning, if you can connect that uh, to what we know about the ocean circulation now. We saw that Western Europe is relatively warm during winter and that Western Europe has relatively small seasonal variations. So, and that is because of the Gulf Stream. And the Gulf Stream is a combination of this thermal headline circulation and the wind-driven circulation. Uh, and, the, and this Gulf Stream brings warm waters from the Caribbean Sea to Western Europe. Um, and now I have here a simulation and you can nicely here see, this is the temperature of the sea surface and you can see here the, the Gulf Stream nicely flowing towards, uh, towards Western Europe. So you can also see that you really have here this, this, this quite small circulation that is warmer than its surroundings. And that is, that is the Gulf Stream. Um, so this is why we see uh, that the Western Europe is warming during winter than, for example, Canada because Canada here doesn't have this warm circulation here. Um, then go to the next slide. Uh, we also saw that there's a lot of precipitation around the equator and there's carbon outgassing at the equator. And that's just because of this equatorial upwelling. Uh, and this needs a little bit of more explanation um, because what happens at the equator is uh, that we have this, this cold water brought to the surface. Uh, and this, this cold water cools down the, the air temperature around the equator a little bit. And colder, you know, colder air is able to hold more, more moisture. 
so more clouds can form here uh, and at some point these clouds uh, cause rain and uh, that's why you have so much rain at this region uh, and the same also applies sort of uh, for the for the carbon and uh, now we get the same animation again and there we can actually see here that this region around the equator is indeed slightly cooler than north and south of it and that is purely because of this 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 equatorial upwelling um, and also the same applies for the for the carbon outgassing um, so then i want to finish up with some final words um, i think we saw that the ocean is important for our climate uh, but i also really want to stress that the ocean is extremely important when looking for climate change um, without our ocean uh, we would have way higher atmospheric CO2 concentrations, way higher temperatures, um, and especially on the time scales of, of, of 10 to hundreds of years, our ocean is going to be the main player in um, taking up carbon out of the atmosphere. So um, this also means that climate change is indeed a very large problem. and. Um, yeah, we should really try to mitigate climate change, in my opinion. Um, and I also really want to finish with saying that I find the ocean very interesting, very interesting to study because it's very complex. It's very difficult to understand sometimes. Uh, and it makes it like a fun puzzle, but also because there's still a lot of two things to learn about the ocean. Um, and that also just looking at the ocean is, uh, is not also always sufficient. The ocean is part of our Earth system, and uh, we need to also uh, take, for example, ice sheets on Greenland into account, the sea ice on the North Pole. It's all very important to look at our climate as a whole and not only at the ocean. But if I would have discussed that, we would have needed way more time. So uh, we just had to suffice with the, with the ocean today. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what I wanted to say uh, today. So uh, please ask questions. Thank you very much, Dan. This was, uh, this was really fascinating and uh, a, a nice journey all around the oceans and understanding a bit more about how, uh, especially the Gulf Stream is created. Um, talking about ocean complexity, we have a question from Luisa in the chat. And she's asking, what is stronger in terms of the, the effects on the, on the ocean currents, the wind-driven circulation or the density temperature effect? Uh, it, the ocean circulation is, is, is mostly wind driven, um, but it's also not a clear, you cannot really clearly separate the two because the thermohaline circulation is also very much dependent on the wind driven circulation. And the wind driven circulation is also very much dependent on the thermohaline circulation. But um, I think you need to look at it at different time scales. So if you're really looking at, you know, one to 50 years, then uh, you will always be looking at the wind driven circulation. But if you go for on the hundreds to thousands of years, you need to look at the thermohaline circulation. Okay, thanks. Thanks for this answer. Um, so attendees in the chat, don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, we, have, we have something like 30 minutes with Dan now. Uh, and I see another question, that's great. Uh, is there anything we can do directly to modify how much the temperature of the ocean changes? So I think this is related more to the climate change aspect of it. Uh, ooh. Directly changing the ocean's temperature is, is not really, really, I think that would be hard. The ocean mostly warms due to the ocean currents and also due to the, the radiation. What you could do, but I'm not really sure now, I'm just uh, suggesting things, is uh, oceans are generally very, very dark. And that means they absorb a lot of heat. Like I said in the beginning, ice reflects a lot of uh, light, a lot of radiation, but the ocean actually absorbs a lot of light. Um, but the ocean's color is to some extent variable so if you can find something to make the for example the ocean surface slightly lighter 
uh, it would absorb less radiation and does not warm as much. But uh, I think the main problem, well, problem is, is that uh, the atmosphere warms and then our ocean responds to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, let's switch to other topics. We have questions that are more uh, probably about your, your path into science. Uh, so yeah, I have two questions for you. Uh, the first one is, why did you decide to study oceans? And what were your favorite subjects at schools? Maybe maybe those relate to each other. I don't know. Hmm. Uh, so to start in my favorite subject at school, I think it was actually history and chemistry. Um, so that's actually two things I basically do nothing with now. <laughs> um, but I was always very interested in, in science in general. Um, and at some point uh, in university, I realized that I was actually very good at physics and mathematics. And if you realize you're good at something, uh, it becomes already a lot more fun. Um, and when I, at university, I actually first thought I wanted to be a civil engineer. So I basically want to construct buildings. Uh, but there was also this, this, this fluid mechanics. So basically learning how, why do fluids move the way they do? Uh, and that just interested me. And at some point I, I, I had a course on physical oceanography. And then I thought like, why am I still even trying to be an engineer? This is, this is what I want to do. I don't know exactly what it was, but it, was, uh, it, it clicked. It was uh, the mathematics, the physics. It was, uh, yeah, it just, uh, yeah. That was, that was it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It was a, a fortunate encounter, we would say. That yeah. Put you on this, on this path. That's great. Uh, let's, I see three other questions in the chat. Uh, let's, let's keep it coming. We'll, we'll stay on track with the, the more uh, um, scientists related side and then we'll go back to, to the oceans. Uh, one of the attendees is asking, uh, could you please describe your date? today uh, uh, work? Do you only work uh, from the lab or sometimes need to go to do field work? What, what does your day-to-day yeah. -day work look like? So um, I am a researcher that only works with com computer models. So I basically sit behind my computer uh, looking at model data and trying to make sense of what the model is, uh, is telling me. Uh, but I also have colleagues that, uh, that, that go on, on, on ships. Um, at least in the Netherlands, we have one research vessel and they, uh, they often go to the Caribbean Sea. And then I'm always a little bit jealous, like, why do I have to work with models? But uh, I, I like models more than, uh, than observations, but I would also like to go to the Caribbean Sea once. <laughs> okay. And so where, where does the data you use for, for your models come from? It comes from the the experiments on site, right? Like in the field or did something else? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the construction of these models is a very, very complicated process. And uh, luckily I'm just a model user and not a model developer. But uh, as far as I understand it, indeed they have measurements uh, and um, we know quite, for most processes, we quite know the physics quite well. So we tell the computer, these are the physics. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we try to see if they uh, match our observations. And then we tr slowly adjust things to the model uh, to make them better represent the, the observations. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's clear. Okay, let's let's go back to, to the ocean then. Luisa is asking us uh, uh, two questions about the the behavior of the ocean. Uh, the first one is, do earthquakes affect ocean currents? Um, generally, I don't think so. Uh, you, when you have earthquakes, you can, of course, get tsunamis. Um, but these are, at least for ocean circulation, uh, from a viewpoint of ocean circulation, these are very fast. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not, not really sure uh, how fast they travel, uh, but you can cross, the, I think they can cross, can cross the Pacific in, in, within one day. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty fast uh, considering that our ocean circulation is, 
uh, mostly important on the, on the yearly time scales. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. But apart from that, they would not, they would not modify the currents uh, on the longer time scale, right? No, no. Unless you really have large changes in, uh, in, um, in the bottom of the ocean, if you're really creating a, a, a strong, a large seamount, for example, because of the earthquake, then you might expect some. But that, okay. I don't think that's, that's ever really happened. Okay. And the second question from Luisa is, uh, is the pollution in the ocean affecting its behavior? So by pollution, I think she means plastic pollution mostly because this is what we hear about. But Luisa, if you, if you want to, to specify also as we go, um, and maybe you can start answering Dan. Yeah. So as looking purely at the, the physics of uh, the ocean, they are not affected by, uh, by plastics. Um, Plastics are what we call basically passive tracers. And that means they just follow the ocean circulation and don't do a lot. Um, but if you look, for example, at ecosystems, we can clearly see that that plastic can do, do harm. Um, but that doesn't mean it really changes the, the way the ocean flows. OK. So yeah, Luisa is... Uh, is uh... Uh, giving us the explanation she was thinking about plastic pollution and also in general all types of waste and as you say they look they there are passive tracers so that does that mean that if we follow them we follow the currents uh, yeah okay 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 good um, uh, and then we have another question uh, from an anonymous attendee saying, I have several questions from the students. What is your personal favorite part of the ocean? And how much practical and experimental experience would scientists visiting with the ocean have in real life? My, yeah. <laughs> favorite part of the ocean. Ooh. Yeah. Maybe you know another way of uh, looking at that is that you are working on the ocean. Do you have a, a kind of personal experience with the ocean, a personal uh, link with it? Um, is it something that you you also like to experience in your personal life? Like I don't know, go to the ocean. Yeah. No, not really. Actually, I mean, I always liked the beach, but the, mm -hmm. the beach is. Uh, is uh, not the ocean, at least uh, not uh, as uh, I'm working with the ocean. Uh -huh. um, so no, I actually don't really have any any experience. Uh, I've ever also not, never been really to the open ocean. I've always been uh, uh -huh. close to the shore if I was ever on a boat. Yeah. Which is interesting because we, we tend to think of scientists as being personally involved in the in the topics that they are studying, right? Like that, that they have a kind of uh, identity link with the topics, especially with climate change and, and the natural world in general. But it's true that you can also have this kind of personal and, and, and professional um, barrier between the two, basically, and you don't have to, to uh, experience the ocean all the time to be like uh, studying it. Yeah, I mean, it's also the, the ocean is so complex that you can get so much uh, passion from several parts. I mean, I really have colleagues that are just really about, they are really climate activists and they're really doing this research because they really care a lot about our climate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that they are also involved with things like Extinction Rebellion. They are that, that much involved. And I have also have colleagues that are very passionate about plastic pollution. Um, but there are also uh, people like me that are just very interested in, in the very interesting behavior of the ocean circulation, the, the, the non-linear flows, the, the mathematics behind it, the models behind it. And, and that is what really, really got me uh, to study the ocean. And uh, I mean, 
what is also partly why I like it is it's, it's because it's it's observable. It, you can it has an effect on on our day to day life. The ocean also, so you can actually also observe it in some sense. Right, right. That's a good point. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. So attendees, if you have other questions, please don't hesitate to write them down. Uh, in the meantime, I, I do have a question for you, Dan. Uh, you mentioned a lot the Gulf Stream as being a, a an example of the Western boundary current, if I'm correct. Yes. Um, and I seem to notice that there were others, but not as strong in other basins. Um, did you focus on the Gulf Stream because it was affecting you affecting Europe, or because it's like the um, most visible one, or uh, what about the others, basically? What about the others, Western uh, boundary currents? Yeah, so one of the reasons I focused on the Gulf Stream because it's also part of the thermal halon circulation. Okay. And the others are not necessarily part of it. Um, but also, uh, this is partly, uh, yeah, oceanography started in Europe. So the Gulf Stream affects Europe. So this is a very classical mm -hmm. point of view to start there. Uh, and that is also probably why I forgot to mention that it was Northern Hemisphere winter and Northern Hemisphere summer. Because, yeah, the way I get taught it, it's always in the Northern Hemisphere Europe uh, perspective. Right. And so is the Gulf Stream. So yeah, people already started studying the Gulf Stream in uh, in the uh, in the eighteenth century, actually. And uh, this is one of the first really uh, well studied sites, actually, uh, for ocean circulation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, regarding the Gulf Stream again, um, we we see press releases and news. Uh, quite a lot of time about climate change and the slowing down of the Gulf Stream. And it's always a bit confusing to, to read about that when you don't know much about it. So could you maybe give us a brief summary of what we know and what we don't know about this slowing down? Yeah. So the main idea behind this slowing down lies in the, in the thermal haline circulation, uh, is that you have this, uh, this sinking around Greenland of, of water masses. Uh, this, this intense mixing over there, uh, and it is density driven. And since the Greenland ice sheet is melting, we get a lot of fresh water in the, in the Atlantic Ocean over there. Uh, and that actually causes the, the surface layer to be, become more stable. So we will have le less mixing. So we will have uh, less water going down there. And if less water is going down there, there also is less transport of water towards it. And that's the Gulf Stream transporting water towards Greenland. Um, and that's the reason why uh, they expect it to slow down. Um, and most model studies indeed show that, that um, it slows down. But we cannot actually really observe that yet because we do not have enough observations actually to really say okay. uh, something certain about it. But mm -hmm. all, all signs point towards that it will will decrease in the future. Uh, so yeah, and the implication of that is actually that uh, Europe will probably uh, become slightly cooler because this Gulf Stream is transporting a lot of heat towards uh, Europe. Okay, very interesting. And interesting to see that we are still lacking data to, to see if uh, the models are uh, aligning with the observations here. Um, okay. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, so I think the the audience has been satisfied with your presentation and your your answers. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining today, and I want to thank Dan again. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Um, before we leave, I wanted to share in the chat a a short feedback form for the audience. If you want to, to give us feedback and uh, this can be used afterwards to help uh, our speakers to improve on their presentations and help us also 
make more of these kind of open events, uh, feel free to answer the questions in this feedback form. Um, and this is all for me today. Thanks again, Dan, 